How All right. Today? I'm doing beautifully. It just started raining here in South Florida, so um, which I, obviously you are in as well. So um, I think I think we needed. It. It's been a hot few days, so always good. Little yeah, rain helps those plants and cools things down. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, we will get started. I know we got a few people in here already. Everybody, thank you for joining. Um, this is episode 12 of the Art of Mindful Medicine, an introduction to our health and wellness practitioners and influencers. My name is Dr. Seth Gilson, a biological dentist, certified yoga teacher, speaker, and personal coach. And we have our very special guest today, Dr. Carolyn George. Dr. George is a board certified, or is board certified in urgent care medicine. She received her undergraduate and medical degrees from the University of Manitoba. She received her postgraduate training in Toronto at St. Mary's Hospital and has practiced in both the United States and Canada. Dr. George has spent over 25 years working in the area of emergency and urgent care medicine, where she observed the long-term consequences of poor lifestyle choices, oversight in management, inadequate patient education, and difficult to treat conditions. She realized her expertise and passion could make a real impact on her patient's health before irreversible damage was, has occurred. Since then, she has focused exclusively on applying a whole system approach of functional and integrative medicine to her practice. Dr. George strongly believes that patients make better choices about their health when they understand all the relevant factors that lead to their disease. And I could not agree more with you on that, on that point for sure. So Dr. George, please introduce yourself, say hello. Um, thank you so much for, for being on here today. Well, thank you for having me, Seth. Absolutely. Uh, it's a pleasure. I uh, really, and I were I think we got the connection back. Okay. You're yeah, the, the weather's, I'm sure the internet's going to be a problem a little bit, but it's okay. Uh, yeah, yes, we'll I appreciate that, and thank you very much. So, um, yeah, we're, me, we're glitching. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a little, it's a little glitchy, but um, like you said, we'll work through it. So, um, again, thank you. I appreciate you coming on here. And as always, I start with gratitude. So if you could please share with us three things that you're grateful for today. Sure. Uh, well, number one, I'm grateful for my health, grateful for having that, because without health, no, really nothing else is, um, is impactful and really matters. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing I'm super grateful for is my amazing family that have always been so supportive. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. wonderful to be surrounded by, by them. And my third gratitude today is the ocean. Uh, I love the ocean. Ah. It's my happy place. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a big scuba diver, and um, so I'm happy to have that as a place to go to. Even in COVID-19, we can get out on a boat and go diving. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And, and a little bit about you. Where are you from? T tell us um, a little bit about your story growing up, uh, personal life, things like that. Sure. Uh, so I actually was born in the States, but mm -hmm. when I was nine, uh, my family moved up to Canada. Um, my father had a good job there. And that's where we lived until I was in my 20s. That's where I went to uh, college. And then I actually moved back down to the States for a couple of years, back down mm -hmm. to Florida uh, in the late 70s. And um, started working at Doctors Hospital in Coral Gables. And that's where my love for medicine kind of really kind of blossomed. I don't mm -hmm. always been interested in it, but that's where I, I really decided that that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so I went back up to Canada and did my uh, medical training at the University of Manitoba and uh, further training in Toronto and uh, dived into ER medicine because I loved the uh, acute nature of it. I loved the immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so that kind of really fed that part of me that really liked to see results because I'm mm -hmm. definitely a type A personality. Mm -hmm. Um, and then after many years of doing that, I did that. I worked all over Ontario, Manitoba. Then we moved back to the States. I got a little tired of that cold weather. Uh, <laughs> I can understand that. Yeah, and there was some aspects of the medicine up there I wasn't wild about. So mm -hmm. we moved to the States and um, have progressively moved further south. <laughs> we ended up back in, back in South Florida um, because, again, love the ocean, love the weather, love the mm -hmm. heat. I never complain about these 95 degree days because yep. I, I know what minus 40 feels like. And yeah. <laughs> much rather do. You'd rather be on this end of the spectrum. Uh, absolutely. hundred percent. Totally agree. So, with you. Uh, yeah. So, and then, then my journey, you know, having children and, and um, 
working nights and weekends in the ER, uh, I totally got burnt out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I really started to find that I needed something to help me balance. Gotcha. Before I had been very good. Um, I had always done yoga for a long, mm -hmm. long time. Um, and I'm really good in those upside down poses. I'm good, you know, um, all over the place. Mm -hmm. But after having children, I really found the difference was I needed, I needed to balance because I needed to be there for them. You know, I just didn't yeah. have so much time to recuperate between shifts and things like that. And that's mm -hmm. when I discovered uh, meditation and mindfulness. Beautiful. Beautiful. That was a, a very good overview. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I want to go back a little bit. Um, and, and could you share with us maybe your, your most vivid memory from childhood, which impacted who you are today? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I wouldn't say I had one memory, um, mm -hmm. but like overall, my father was always very curious. He was always very um, interested in in new, learning new things, and he still does. He's ninety nine. He's still learning new things. Beautiful. And so I, that's where I kind of developed my curiosity about medicine and the the, the body mm -hmm. and the brain and that connection between the brain and the body. Uh, and so it, it was multiple small, small things, not just one big event. Awesome. Awesome. That, that makes total sense to me. I mean, um, it, it's more of a consistent thing that you see over time and you, and you can consistently see results from those things. Um, so that makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, I know you talked briefly about your journey, but what, what inspired you to become a physician? Hmm. Um, I just love learning about the body. I, I would love to say it was, mm -hmm. you know, wanting to help mankind, but it wasn't really at that mm -hmm. point. It was the the actual mechanical um, events, like how how the body can do the things it can do, was just always amazing mm -hmm. to me. And so I wanted to mm -hmm. learn about it. Uh, it was really that kind of curious mind. And then in in the ER again, you know, you're dealing with heart attacks and car crashes and stuff like that. So you're putting mm -hmm. bones together. It's very very connected, right? You can make that temporal relationship. Um, yeah. And the more I got into that, the more I realized how important the brain was to everything else that goes on. So that continued mm -hmm. my journey. Absolutely. And I can completely relate to that because I, like, I, the same thing, I just was, I became at, in, in middle school and, and high school studying science and math and things. You just, I just became so intrigued with the body and how it worked and the just I didn't, how little I actually knew about it, and I just wanted to know more. So I can completely relate to that. And then that journey kind of takes you down the road to, to seeing the bigger picture and the, the benefits of, of being someone that, that wants to share that knowledge with others. So um, I can completely understand that. Um, and then I know you talked a little bit about what, what your drive was that with the instant gratification um, of emergency and urgent care medicine, but what, what ultimately led you to pursue that versus uh, the plethora of other fields in medicine. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, well, I think that feeling of um, going in and making a difference to somebody <clears throat> right away was a big thing. Um, mm -hmm. I looked at, you know, chronic diseases is, you know, just, it just took too long to see results and, you know, young and I, I wanted to have those results right away. Yep. So I like that piece. And I also like the, the shift work. I like being able to go in and then leave and go in and leave. Yeah, the schedule is that. Yeah, I remember because I did research it at um, a couple hospitals, and and I shattered a little bit in the ER. And it's, I, I mean, you can tell me what your experience was. It's like they, they'll be on call for like two weeks, and then have two weeks completely off or something like that. And to me, that sounded pretty pretty cool. Um, but my my focus obviously shifted to dentistry, which is, I mean, again, um, the hours aren't quite like that. But you also do get to see direct results and in instant gratification with people. I mean, people can come in one visit and you can completely change mm -hmm. the, not only what they look like, but how they feel. Right. And um, it was very, it's very, very profound. So right. I, I, again, completely relate to that. Um, and what would you say, what, what, what do you remember as being the most inspiring moment from being in, uh, in emergency medicine? Um, you know what, some of the things that touched me the most is um, being with people as they're passing uh, mm -hmm. in their, their last moments. And that really um, made me very connected wow, to yeah. the fact that we're all here for a period of time. 
and we're all going to die. That's one thing that we know for certain, right? Taxes and death. Yeah. Um, and, and so it really made me kind of acutely aware that I want to do the best that I can while I have this time on earth. And part of that was really uh, valuing the body that I've got because I've only got one. Mm -hmm. Right. And we, we value a lot of things, jewelry, cars, houses, things like that, but we can replace them all if we trash them. Yep. We, we can't replace our bodies. So exactly. that was one thing that, you know, I really started to make that connection. And those people in that very um, critical time as they're passing and, and just being with them um, was really powerful to me. Yeah. And I mean, I, 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 again, you being the doctor has working directly on those patients is very different from being in the room of, of people working on those patients. But I, I've been in, in, those, in those moments before and just the, that you can't be any more present. No. Right. I mean, it, it is as real as life kind of gets and being in that moment and you are completely or intensely aware of so much more that is going on. Um, not that I suggest like people try and go and explore and seek out <laughs> the, these, these experiences, but right. it, it um, just take the word of the people that go through it on a regular basis. It is a very profound um, moment uh, in, in life. So um, I commend you for that. And, and I, I, I can definitely see how you awakened, so to say, in, in that sense, from those type of experiences. Um, and now having been in that for over 25 years, can you explain in a little bit more detail why you ended up leaving emergency medicine? Sure. Um, well, the, the intensity of it really started to burn me out. Most ER docs <laughs> last 10 to 15 years, depending on mm -hmm. the acuity of the hospital that they're in. Um, so I was not in a super high acute hospital, and I did try to take a lot of time off. Like you say, you, you've got that week or two, and you can travel or do something. Mm -hmm. So I tried to really find the balance in my life. Um, but ultimately, I just found that going in there and somebody's got a heart attack and you shock them and bring them back to life. Then they go back out and months or years later, they're back in with more chest pain. And, you know, you haven't really helped them. And I wanted to start to get mm -hmm. to people before they had those issues and help people understand mm -hmm. that what they do day to day is going to impact them in the long term. And so whether you mm -hmm. get up and exercise or, eat a Danish or, uh, you know, uh, go out for, you know, go do yoga, meditate. Everything that you do is going to have a long-term consequence one way or the other. And I really wanted mm -hmm. to start to reach people and teach them the food they eat, you know, just the, the, the uh, mind, their, their stress management, all these types of things can have a huge impact and take them down a completely different path than the one that they would go otherwise. And I was seeing that path that they were on. And I wanted just to say, okay, this is not good. Let's, how can we help you, your family, your kids, everybody around you to learn from what you're going through? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, that's beautiful. And I mean, <clears throat> what, so therefore, I mean, what was that experience like? So when, I mean, when, when you decided to leave, I mean, what, did you already have an idea of where you were going with it? I mean, did, I mean obviously, we're going to get into what functional and integrative medicine are. But, I mean, did, had you had heard about these things? I mean, did, did you just plan on going to family practice? I mean, how did you what, – what was that journey, that period of time like for you? Sure. So the most pivotal time was right after my children were born. I had three kids under three. I had a daughter wow. who was not quite three and twin boys. Wow. Um, and um, – up to that point, I had been working full time and just really burnt out. So I took some time off to be with them because I, I knew that I didn't, I, I wanted to be uh, there mothering them and, and not um, out back to work. So mm -hmm. to me, that was just important. So then I went back to work and the difference, right? I was always shortchanging somebody, either my patients, my learning ability to learn new things that were going mm -hmm. on or being with them. And so I found myself very stressed. Uh, developed what you, you might call adrenal fatigue. Mm -hmm. I don't like that term, but it's uh, it is definitely an overload of your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I just burnt out essentially. And in that burnout, I was trying to figure out what things helped me because I had headaches for years straight every day, a headache, just mm -hmm. you know, no energy, just trying to show up every day. Yeah. Um, and in my my 
path, my journey trying to figure that out, I discovered nutrition. I discovered, uh, I'd always exercised. Um, remember, I'm a type A personality, so we've got to exercise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I discovered nutrition. I had been brought up very um, kind of German background, meat, potatoes, maybe a vegetable. And if it was a vegetable, usually canned. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I didn't have a big background in, in, in uh, nutrition and certainly did not get it in medical school. Yeah. So I had to learn all those things. And one by one, I was reading, I was learning, I was talking to people, I was uh, just exploring this whole piece more. And then I found functional medicine. And when I found it, I went to my first conference and it was like, I have found my tribe. <laughs> These people like really, I really connect with them. Yeah. And, and that was a, a huge, to me, that was just the switch got turned on and I couldn't look back. Yeah, no, and that, that's beautiful. I mean, I, and I, um, in, in a very different way, ha, have kind of evolved into that same mindset, so to speak. Um, when you just start going, first you start with that self-exploration. I mean, first you start, you created that space. So, I mean, you, you, when you had your kids, you created that space. You distanced yourself from the, the job and you, you got to living your life. And, and then going back, you're just like, whoa, 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 this and and one of the benefits of it, what everybody's going through right now, I think, is that everybody's kind of had to take a step back and you create space. You're like, OK, this is a great time to look and reevaluate what is going on in my life. What am I doing? What am I pursuing? What's really important? So I, I think that's beautiful. And, and unfortunately, it, sometimes it takes a, a, a degree of trauma for people to reach that point. Um, but mm -hmm. that's, again, why we do things like this to share this knowledge and these experiences not just of our own, but people that we've worked with in the past. And, and I think that's extremely powerful and very, very beneficial for people um, in, the, in their overall lives. And, and like you said, for um, long-term consequences, because one way or another, there's going to be long-term consequences to what we're doing. Yeah, everything. Every, every decision we make, there's, it moves us a little way in one direction or another. Yeah. And, and in no doubt, um, I'm sure... And then, like I said, like you said, you had always worked out and practiced yoga and things like that. But I, I would imagine that this time in your life really changed your perspective and, and introduced you to what mindful living is really like what it really is. Um, mm -hmm. So if you could share with us, what, what does mindfulness mean to you now? Yes, sure. Um, well, I um, I like John Kabat-Zinn's definition, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> uh, right being um, how does he put it? Be mindfully aware, um, compassionate. Um, let's see, how does he put it? Uh, it's awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose uh, in the present moment and non judgmentally. Mm -hmm. That's yep. how he phrases it. Yes, um, it, those, those are definitely the key words that he uses. So. <laughs> right? And so for me, it's good for me to be that way with myself, right? Mm -hmm. As well as with the, my patients and my family and things like that. So. Um, I found meditation first through yoga and at mm -hmm. first it was just, you know, the two minutes at the end of the yoga when they make you lay down on the mat and you try to quiet your mind. Mm -hmm. um, and then as my kids were small and I was, you know, okay. all over the place, I can mm -hmm. tell you, um, <laughs> um, I knew that I had to do some of that to really slow me down because otherwise mm -hmm. I could, um, so I explored it more and did more meditation and then took John, uh, the, the course, uh, the mindfulness-based stress reduction. Uh, I took that with Beautiful. my daughter, actually, which was wonderful because Very doing nice. that together was really special. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I can I only imagine. It must be. Yeah, it was really cool. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've incorporated it more and more and now try to help all my patients learn that, too. Beautiful. Uh, and, and what are some things that you do, what's what are some habits or, or methods or, or practices that you use to incorporate mindfulness in your daily life? Um, well, I think everybody uh, likes to do it different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I have found some of the to me for me what works the best is to just incorporate in, into my daily life. Um, and so it might be something as simple as I'm going to get into the shower and I'm going to stay in the shower. Right. Mm -hmm. Just how many of us we walk in the shower and we're thinking about the day and what we've got to do. And we're not at all present to the smell of the soap or the feel of, you know, washing our body, you know, uh, the, the humidity in there. None of that. Mm -hmm. So um, I will not every day, but I'll often try to do that as I get into the shower mm -hmm. and just stay in the shower or brushing my teeth. Just 
really brushing my teeth and mm-hmm. not thinking about other things. For me, mindfulness is really just kind of bringing myself from that, all the scattered thoughts into mm-hmm. what I'm feeling, what I'm seeing, what I'm thinking, what I'm hearing, right? Using all those senses in that moment. Um, and it can be when I'm cooking and smelling the spices rather than thinking, you know, what's the next thing I need to do. Mm-hmm. So I just try to incorporate it into my day um, in, a, in little bits and pieces. You know, obviously there are times that you have to plan, right? Yeah. There's, there's times you need to be thinking. Uh, and I certainly do that, but I try to purposely incorporate it into the, just the activities of daily living. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's being it's being intentional with your with your actions. Uh, I mean, it, it it also helps you create a level of discipline, which is important in life. I th- I just think that's something important for all of us to be able to to control ourselves in, in a sense to to have that control over what we will do and that we make it ourselves a priority. I think is extremely important. Yeah. Um. So, so what, why is it that you think mindfulness is important for good health? What, what exactly are the, some of the positive results that you've seen and experienced from it? Great question. Um, so they've studied this, right? There's all kinds of studies on mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Um, and we see that it has both uh, psychological impacts, it's got cognitive impacts, it's got physical impacts. Um, and so these things can be measured. And uh, I know myself that I feel a lot of these benefits and I see it with my patients. So many people are anxious out there, Mm -hmm. right? Anxiety I see in probably eight out of 10 of my patients have really significant anxiety. Um, Of course, COVID-19 has not helped that. It's made it worse. And so when uh, somebody is mindful, that brings a lot of things together. So there's um, increased work satisfaction, increased uh, relationship quality, because you're, you are, as you say, intentional about spending time with somebody. And when you're with them, you're not on the phone, you're not going, uh-huh, 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 and not listening to them. Mm-hmm. Right? Your, your relationships improve, your communication improves. That tends to bring your stress level down, less anxiety, less yep. depression, and ultimately an increased sense of meaning in life because you are being really intentional about it. And then all those types of things increase to increased happiness, mm-hmm. increased happiness, increased feeling of control. Um, and that helps to bring our blood pressure down, mm-hmm. uh, decreases our levels of cortisol. We have better sleep. Um, they have actually looked at neural integration. That's better. They've looked at the thickness of our, our the cortical part of our brain, and that mm-hmm. actually increases with that being mindful and paying attention to where you have pain in your body might make you feel it more, but actually it decreases that sense of pain. Mm-hmm. So there's yeah, if, a, lot and of, I think, a lot of benefits. And then, yeah. Yeah. yeah, go on. No, no, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> it, the connection got a little uh, slow, no, so I, I thought you kidding. stopped, so I started. <laughs> right, right, right. I know we're, we're constantly kind of glitching. I hope people aren't uh, having too much glitchiness. Uh, I was just saying that just kind of leads then to increased creativity. Um, mm-hmm. Your mind wanders less. Your memory is better. Your attention's better. Your problem solving gets better. Uh, you know where you left the keys, right? Because you're doing yeah. it intentionally, right? So you're not, yeah. you know, going crazy trying to find these things. Anyways, it's so yeah. just a, a multitude of benefits. Absolutely, and I, and I again, I not only been able to witness in myself, but I, I've been able to see these changes for, for other people. And um, it, it's absolutely amazing. And I mean, it feels phenomenal. So um, what are some of the ways that, that you incorporate this in, in practice? How do you, how do you, I mean, because for example, you were in emergency and urgent care, instant gratification. That is a, uh, a huge topic today. I mean, people are all about instant gratification. So when you see someone that's a new patient, I mean, talking to somebody, you don't just immediately start talking to them about mindful practices and do yoga and meditation and things like that. So how do you kind of introduce this to people initially? Mm-hmm. Um, it depends on the individual. Some people are already doing it. Mm-hmm. And then we expand on what they're doing. Uh, but a lot of people aren't. And so we just talk about their anxiety piece or their depressed mood piece. Um, and some of the other things, uh, the cognitive issues that people experience, you know, not remembering things 
And so we'll sometimes talk, I'll always bring in meditation as something that I think is useful for stress management, mm -hmm. but not everybody's ready to meditate. Mm -hmm. um, but almost everybody can kind of slow down, get out in nature, smell the flowers, right? And they don't even recognize that that's really being mindful. So we, we start to kind of explore it from, from that venue and then we talk about different apps. There's all mm -hmm. kinds of apps uh, that people can use. So first just talking about the importance of that and then looking at ways to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and apps like Headspace, um, or Calm, you know, there's tons of apps that do not only the meditation but mindfulness because they are a little different. Yeah, and, and that makes sense. I mean, there's different different methods that, for different people. Some people are going to be more inclined to use their phone and use these apps. Some other people are going to be more inclined to sit and in a cross-legged position and close their eyes and meditate. Some people can do that. Other people can't do that, and they and they might in order to get into meditation. Because I mean, there, for, to my knowledge, and what my belief is that there's a lot of different types of meditation, from walking meditation, driving meditation, the nature meditations, and then there's also just a sitting meditation. So I think, like you said, it, it's very individual um, for the person, and um, it's important to get to know that person first before and kind of let them make that decision for themselves. It's just you kind of be, I guess, being a guide for them in, the, in that respect. Right. Yeah. And just helping them to figure out, like I give them all kinds of ways to explore it. And there's, you know, just tons out there. You just Google it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody's got a different way that they like to access it, different voices that they like. Sometimes people like quiet, like you say, um, but just something as simple as just taking a, a piece of food, right, a, a raisin or something, and just really living with that and smelling it and feeling it, you know, just going through all the senses with those mm -hmm. types of things. And just a minute of doing that just starts to refresh. Uh, or for other people, it's breathing, right? Just, mm -hmm. just slowing down their breath. And I'll really encourage people to do that before they eat mm -hmm. because – we don't want to be eating in that fight or flight mode. We want to be eating in that rest, digest, and restore mode. Mm -hmm. So just three to five nice deep breaths and saying your gratitude starts to slow them down and brings them to that present moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talk a lot about, about present moment and being grateful to all the people that brought them the food. You know, there's just so many people involved in that whole chain to bring you mm -hmm. what you're eating every day. Um, so just doing these types of things can be another way to kind of enter into mindfulness. Yeah, no, that that's absolutely true. Um, uh, taking a, the, a little bit of time to appreciate wh whatever it is that you're doing, whatever whether you're eating or not, um, I, I think that's something that, Amer especially in American culture, at least from my, from my experience, is something that's that's lacking. There's always go 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 something. Some, what's next? What's next? Keep moving. Yeah. And, and even eating on the go. And I, I'm, I mean, I'm guilty of this. I mean, in the morning, like I'm, I'm, I drive to, I'll drive to work with my smoothie in my hand. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's really important to slow down um, at least sometimes. And, that, and that's a, a, a really um, peaceful way to get started and, and transition in, into living a more mindful life, as we, as we say. Right. And you have a really good point uh, because – People tend to think it's a, like a mark of um, strength to go, go, go and to not slow down, right? Yeah. We kind of advertise, oh, we don't go to bed till 1 o'clock, we're up at 6, we're, you know, we're doing this, that, and the other yeah. thing. Whereas I wish as a culture that we would really emphasize slowing down, being intentional, spending mm -hmm. quality time with ourselves as mm -hmm. well as people. Um, I think we would just be a lot more happy, less anxious society if we emphasize that rather than the, the doing, doing, doing more the being, you know, yeah. I can't remember who is, who says this, but we are human beings, not human doings. And I, Oh yes. Um, I, I think I, I'm pretty sure I've heard Eckhart Tolle say that. Yeah. 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 Very, very great. Te uh, a great teacher. Great. Um, so, Moving in, I mean, obviously, because this is a, is a very, when you meet people for the first time and you, and you start talking about all these things, it, it can be very overwhelming for people. Um, so what, what would you say that you wish for all people to understand about their health, wherever they're at on the spectrum, wherever they currently are, um, and, and whoever they're working with, what, what is it that you just, you, you try to convey to people and that you wish more people would understand about themselves? 
Um, a few things. So I think um, some people think, well, I'm overweight. I'm going to always be overweight. I'm diabetic. I'm always going to be diabetic. I might as well just give in and, and do this. <laughs> but if they understood that every decision they make, everything that they do can have a positive impact. And so it's not doing 20 things at once and completely changing your diet. And, you know, you, you don't have to go all in to make a, a benefit, right? Mm -hmm. so my journey was very, very gradual. I used to be known as a junk food queen. I just loved junk food, chips, Doritos. I mean, I lived on that in the ER. We had a candy drawer, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where I got my energy. And it was very gradual that I started to eat vegetables and started to cook for myself. And, you know, all of these little steps take time. And mm -hmm. that's okay, we don't have to do it all at once. Mm -hmm. You know, when you come see me, we're going to talk about several things. But again, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so I wish people really understood that, that just that little thing, maybe they don't eat after 8 o'clock. Maybe they're going to exercise three times a week. And they just work on one little thing for a while. Mm -hmm. Try to implement that and make it a habit, just like brushing our teeth is. Right? Yeah. We don't ever say we're too busy to brush our teeth or too busy, uh, you know, um, or, or too tired to brush our teeth, right? We just don't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, creating the good habits are, are extremely, extremely important. And then being disciplined to stick to them because you, you know what the long-term consequences of not doing such things are. Right, but these little, little pieces are cumulative. Um, so that's mm -hmm. a big thing I wish people got because they just tend to give up and all, uh, you know, they go with the flow, which we are, in functional medicine, we are salmon swimming upstream. No mm -hmm. question about it. Um, but the more people we start to turn on to this, the less we're going to be like those salmon. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing I wish that they uh, really, really uh, were really understood. I mean, that everybody knows it, but really kind of thought about was the fact that we only have one body and we really need to take care of this one body. We don't get second chances, right? Our body's really resilient. It can deal with a lot of blows. But yeah. at two points you know, it's, it's, it's not going to recover. Um, and so the more that they were respectful of the fact that we've got this one beautiful, amazing body that does so many cool things that we still don't even understand. I mean, with yeah. all, all the science we've got, we still don't understand how a lot of these things happen. Um, and just to be super respectful of that and take care of it, um, you know, rather mm -hmm. than just abusing it and thinking, ah, you know, well, I'll take a medicine. I can eat whatever I want. I'll just take more insulin. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I just uh, wish they got that, you know, think of this like your most expensive favorite car and you wouldn't put crappy fuel in it, right? Yeah, the oil I, I use that same that analogy. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a great analogy. People get that because yeah. they, they really they can relate to it. Car. Yeah, it stays in the garage, no bird droppings mm -hmm. on it, right? Yeah. Put a cover over it. But man, they'll treat their body like, you know what, right? Not yeah. sleep, feed it crap, lousy fuel, no rest. Mm -hmm. It's like they're wanting to whip that force rather yeah. than giving it water and food and rest. Yeah, so. absolutely. It's a, I can't agree with you more. It's a completely different mindset. And, and it's unfortunate. And I think it comes like what you said, that go, go, go mentality that, that it, it's kind of um, sunk into every aspect of life. And whether, whether it's your, your work life or, um, what you feed yourself and, and, and really ultimately what it, it, to me, it seems like it comes down to self love and that's something that we're just not taught mm -hmm. and, and, and it's not perpetuated because the yeah, the abuse ourselves, take care of other people, but yeah, just abuse yourself. And, and how long will that work for? And I mean, it, it, it's not as long as we'd like, or we'd, or we, or we'd like to think that it is anyways. Um, right. So that, that competitive mentality, I, I completely is, is very detrimental and, um, and it kind of, like I said, seeps its way into every aspect of life and, and we're seeing results of it. I mean, what, things that, that happen in the world, whether it's in the, in the agriculture industry or, or in health and, and mental health, because uh, ultimately this, the, the foods that you eat that are good for you are going to promote your mental health and you're going to have more clarity and, more, and you're going to feel more energy and you're going to want to do more things. But when you don't feed yourself that way, you get the opposite effect. I mean, it, it really is a result. And that's why, like you said, the, the, the gas in the car is like, if you want to use high test versus regular, I mean, it's going to affect how the car runs. I mean, eventually you're going to have a real problem with the engine if you're not using the right kind of 
gasoline. So, I mean. And people just uh, somehow don't get that the food they eat, what they take into their mouth, becomes the cells. Mm -hmm. It becomes your eye cells, your brain cells, your hair cells, your intestinal cells, your muscles. Yep. You're putting crappy junk in there, you got crappy cells, mm -hmm. right? And so no wonder you feel tired, brain fogs, fogs, anxious, right? Your skin doesn't glow, uh, your hair falls out. It's because you, you got lousy building blocks. They're yeah. not working well. So yeah. yeah, we spend time talking about all those kinds of things. Yeah, good. And um, I, I think that's extremely important. And then that brings me to, uh, to you talking a little bit about what is functional and integrative medicine? Okay. Um, so... Um, People are, I think, more familiar with integrative medicine uh, mm -hmm. or complementary medicine. So that's things like acupuncture, nutrition, uh, chiropractor. Um, uh, you know, there's just a whole variety of different practitioners out there. Uh, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, they're considered alternative mm -hmm. or complementary to conventional medicine or allopathic mm -hmm. medicine. So. That is uh, certainly something I do. I'm very aware that, that conventional medicine doesn't hold all the answers, right? There's a lot of other practitioners out there that bring a lot to the table that can help people in their mm -hmm. journey. But functional medicine is different. It's not truly alternative and it's not truly integrative. It is conventional medicine, but taken a step further. Mm -hmm. So in conventional medicine, we generally ask what? What's the diagnosis? What medicine can I use? What surgery can I use? It's more of a what question. Mm -hmm. Functional medicine is more of a why question. Why do you have this? Why did this happen to you? You know, it's, it's a more of a why. Everything that we, anytime we get a, a diagnosis, we'll say, why did, why did this happen? Why now? Why not mm -hmm. before? Why not later? It's mm -hmm. a lot of why questions. And to answer that, we have to be detectives. And so we're really looking for that root cause. That's another mm -hmm. term for functional medicine is root cause medicine. And so we're looking at a timeline, and that's a big thing that all the functional medicine practitioners that are kind of practicing the way we're trained, some, some have veered off, but most of us will still do a timeline. And we sit with the patient and go from birth to the present, and all the things that went through their life, their medical history, um, uh, surgical history, dental history, environmental history, birth history, you know, we just go through all this stuff and we put things on a timeline so we can see, you know, your blood pressure started here. You started a new job here. You had a death in the family here. Uh, you weren't, you were really busy in this job here. You weren't eating well. And we start to then put the pieces together that maybe their blood pressure is because they're under a lot of stress, not sleeping, not eating any foods with magnesium in it, um, and maybe not sleeping well. So we try to figure out that root cause so that we can then address it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I wouldn't use a high blood pressure medicine on them uh, mm -hmm. because if their blood pressure is super high, I don't want them to stroke out. I will still use conventional medicines, but my goal is not to keep them on that because mm -hmm. if that blood pressure is just, you just use the blood pressure medicine and you don't address those underlying causes, then you need a higher dose of blood pressure medicine in a few years, and then you need a second medicine, and then you mm -hmm. need a third medicine. Right, because the underlying cause has never been addressed. And these other medicines, medications generally have side effects too. Yeah, all of them, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, whereas sleeping more doesn't have a bad side effect. And yeah. know, uh, exercising <laughs> can sometimes with your joints, um, but managing your stress takes up time, but you know, no real <laughs> I mean, side effects. Yeah. Right, so, so that's, that's the huge difference there, but it takes responsibility really it takes personal responsibility because if we see that you need those things so many people go well i can't quit my job i can't mm -hmm. cut anything out of my my work life i can't cut anything out of my family life um, i'm still going to just not give myself what i need and then those people don't succeed uh, mm -hmm. in functional medicine anyways because they're not willing to make the changes that mm -hmm. are necessary whereas other people are going Okay, I see. I can see it now. I see what's happening, and then they they talk to their boss about not working weekends or you know not working nights, or they mm -hmm. start to make some some uh, barriers, some you know uh, limits to what they're going to do, and they start mm -hmm. to eat more, start to cook at home, you know, just again little little pieces, 
and then they start to feel better and then they go, oh, that actually works. And then they start to do other things. Mm -hmm. So it all, it, it has to start small because the, the big things you do everything at once, it never lasts. Yeah, I, create, creating habits is, uh, is a progressive, a, a slow and steady process. Like you said, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and, and it seems to me like, it, it sounds like functional medicine is more um, like wellness care rather than sick care. It, it's more preventative and, 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 and proactive rather than reactive. Definitely, but it can be uh, chronic sickness care. Like mm -hmm. you wouldn't use this for a car accident. Right? Yeah, exactly. You need surgery, you need surgery. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm not against conventional medicine. Of Definitely course. Got, got its place, acute care. You know, we need antibiotics, but we don't need to use it to treat a cold, right? Yeah, exactly. We need antibiotics, but we shouldn't be using it willy-nilly to prevent things because yeah. it generally doesn't prevent them. Um, so uh, it's got its place, but... I see some people who are uh, in that, you know, the diabetes is building up, so they're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And so we got to pull back. we got to work at their diet, their stress management, their sleep, all of these things. Look yeah, at their absolutely. environment, right? Heavy metals, uh, all the things that are around us that can impact our health. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's, a, it's definitely multifactorial. Um, I, I, I completely agree with you. <laughs> um, so, so, how do you continuously find inspiration um, uh, to, or how do you continually inspire patients to, to want to create a healthier life for themselves? Um, you know, I think one of the things that I do um, is help people find their why because mm -hmm. people will come, we'll talk about their goals and they'll have a list of goals <clears throat> and then we'll try to talk about why do they want those things to happen, right? What's, what's their big why? <clears throat> is it because they want to grow old and be with their grandkids? Is it because they've got somebody that they're, um, you know, they want to help? You know, why is it? Is it because they, they just feel like they're not contributing to society? So we kind of help to dive into their why. <clears throat> and then when they're getting uh, two periods where, and everybody does this, they kind of go, oh, you know, it's, this is too hard. I can't do this or it's not working. Then we help them kind of go back to that why. So it just... Mm -hmm help them remember, how do you want your body to feel? How did mm -hmm. it used to feel, right? How, when did you last feel well? So those are some of the things that we'll talk about to help them kind of know that it's possible. Um, and then I use a lot of tools. I'm kind of a big data geek. Um, so I do some questionnaires that I do with them at every visit. Mm -hmm. um, some people are not so happy about doing them, but in the long run, it just takes five minutes. Uh, yeah. But in the long run, then we can we can look at like the score that when they come in is maybe 150 of their symptom score, and then it's 150 or 140 for a little while, and then after time it's 130, 120. Mm -hmm. Maybe that goes down to 50, but then it goes back up to 70. So we kind of follow that curve. Yeah. And six or eight months out, when they're coming back and they're going, I don't think this is working. I don't feel any different. You know. Is, I, is this really worth it? Then I can show them and I say, look back here. Remember, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you had that chronic neck pain. You were not sleeping through the night. Yeah. And now they sleep through the night, and, but they maybe still have a rash or hair loss or something like that that's going on. So they're, they're focused on that key thing, but they've forgotten about that whole journey that they went through and all the issues they had to start with. So I use that as a little reminder to help them uh, just see where they've come and all the good things that they've done yeah it, it's you, you got to play a little bit of psychologist as well i, I imagine or, or psychiatrist whichever one uh, um with these types of things because and i and this is i mean d being into sports and fitness my whole life i mean i can guarantee you and i, I mean this is actually proven through studies i mean your bot i mean your mind will give up before your body Mm -hmm. So yes, I, if, yes. we, if we can, if we can get through that, that we, if we can push through the mental aspect of it, like if we can get up, get dressed, put our shoes on to go run, we'll go run. Mm -hmm. You know, right. I mean, it's just, it, you just got to get the, through the mental fortitude, so to speak, to, right. to go and do it. I, and then, right. like you said, everything else you have to do, right? Just yeah, get to exactly. Um, and, and, and it's very easy to have short term memory. I mean, like you said, tracking your results is extremely important. I mean, knowing where you started and I, I'm trying to think like, for example, someone that's losing weight, they're seeing themselves progressively lose weight. So you kind of have a little bit of amnesia, so to speak, about what you, where you started at. So that, that's why documenting is so important. So I think that's a, a very, very 
um, integral port, integral part of, of your practice. And you can show people that do feel like, hey, I'm falling off a little bit or what's going on here? I don't feel anything because you're not going to feel something every day. I mean, these are very small changes. And, and one thing I really talk to people about is you, it took you what my, your average patient is what, maybe in their 40s, 50s, something like that took you 40, 50 years to get to this point. It's not going to take you six months to fix it all. So, I, I mean, people need to be realistic about their results and, and it's whether it's functional medicine, dentistry, mental health. I mean, there, there's a whole plethora of things. You, these things take time and it's dedication. I mean, it's, it's about being dedicated to yourself and living your best life for, again, we'll go back to what you, you brought up as those long-term consequences. Do you want those long-term consequences to be positive in your life? Do you want to be able to, to stand and walk at 90 or even reach 90? Right. Or do you want to be in a wheelchair where you can't do anything and you're stuck in a room looking at a TV all day long? I mean, because these things, this is how people live now, unfortunately. Now. Yeah. We yeah. are living much longer, but mm -hmm. we're much thicker in those yeah. last years, right? Yeah. So, so you can argue want, that you're not really living at that point. So. Right. No, we're just dying longer. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. So one thing that, that I know we talked about that you, you taught me a new term. Uh, which is concierge doctor. Um, so what, how is a, a functional medicine doctor different from a concierge doctor or from an integrative doctor? Um, so a functional medicine doctor can also be integrative. So mm -hmm. I'm functional medicine, but I also refer out to all the different practitioners that can be helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. Chinese medicine, acupuncture, nutritionists, um, neuromuscular massage therapists, right? You, you name it. Um, chiropractors, um, all of these, all of these people can be part of the team. Mm -hmm. so you can be both, but they're not the same. Yeah. Uh, concierge doctor is one that's in the conventional world who has elected to take less people on. Uh, they still take insurance and they will still bill your insurance, but they typically will charge an annual fee, mm -hmm. $1,000, $2,000, depends on the particular individual, um, uh, as a kind of um, a membership, if you will, and then they take less people and they promise then to get you in if you're sick, right? You don't have to wait a week. You don't have to, um, you, you can usually get in within a day or two. If you need to call them at nighttime because something's going on, you've got their phone number. So it really is like a, a VIP type of mm -hmm. service, but it's conventional medicine. Okay. So when you call them at night with, you've got a stuffy nose, they're going to call you in a ZPAC. Yeah. Right? For the most part, right? Just, Obviously, some doctors are waking up to the fact that we shouldn't be calling in antibiotics for everything, but mm -hmm. they're, they're going to do what they can do, uh, but it's just going to be more immediate. So you're getting the service. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, um, and, and what, is that something, or, or is there something like that that you offer at your practice? Um, well, generally, we try to get people in uh, if they have an acute thing within mm -hmm. a couple of days. So we do mm -hmm. try to do that, but I'm not their primary care physician. So... Um, while I absolutely prefer that they call me if they've got the sniffles and I can talk to them about many different things they can do that are not antibiotics to get better. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm happy to do that. And we are, uh, we do packages. So we uh, like to see them like every month. So we're mm -hmm. trying to get in and seeing them and being proactive and helping them to create these new habits and to give them the support when they need it, you know, hold out that little carrot, hold them accountable. Mm -hmm really try to help them kind of create the habits that they've, that we've talked about them creating. Gotcha. Um, so we do a lot of those types of things and I am actually working on creating a membership model so that the people uh, that can come in. So my people that have done packages and are now much healthier um, and don't need, you know, the, the one month thing, they can, mm -hmm. um, they can come in and access some of the things that we've got. So we have a lot of cool things in the office mm -hmm. um, that, can offer them to help keep them healthy. Gotcha. So, so you you would not be, um, so you, you would not technically be someone's primary care physician. Correct. Is that right? right. Okay. So they, they would still go, for example, seeing their their PCP for blood work and things like that annually and stuff. And then you would basically possibly order more labs or or, or look at some other aspects in addition to and kind of work with the PCP to create uh, that per the, the individual's best health, basically. Is that, is that how it works? Um, a little bit, but um, generally the PCPs 
A, don't know about functional medicine. And mm -hmm. so I'm happy to talk to any uh, specialist, any, P any PCP about the people that I'm seeing. <clears throat> but we don't generally communicate just because they're, it's a time crunch for them in particular, right? They've got mm -hmm. 30 or 40 yeah. people a day. They don't have time to call and spend 10 minutes to talk to me about a particular issue. Uh, yeah. But I, I, I don't take insurance. Uh, I'm I am outside the insurance model, so mm -hmm. I do give people a super bill if they if they desire that they can submit. Now a lot of people do. Uh, okay. If they do it out of network coverage. Gotcha. Get it out of network. So I do like for them to have a PCP that's in network because uh, some of the insurance companies are getting a little bit more challenging in terms of ordering labs. I try yeah. To use One or the other. Yeah. Right. So I try to use their insurance for uh, the conventional labs. We do do specialty labs, and sometimes they can use insurance for that too, um, but not always. Gotcha. So I like them to have that PCP um, as a kind of way to kind of interact with the insurance model because I mm -hmm. do think it's important to have insurance. You never know when anything catastrophic is going to happen, and you need mm -hmm. that. Um, so uh, I work kind of beside as more of a consultative uh, feature to try to help them address their uh, IBS, their thyroid issues, their, um, um, you know, any of the autoimmune issues, mm -hmm. all the things that we talk about, their diabetes, right? Yeah. So I work with them to try to address those and certainly do conventional labs, but I'm not mm -hmm. going to do, for women, I'm not going to do gynecologic care. Uh, mm -hmm. For men, I'm not going to do, you know, kind of the male annual exam, that type of thing. So gotcha. Yeah, so that's kind of the difference. Okay, that makes sense. Um, good, because I'm sure that that's important for people to know um, when when they're calling your office to, to they may they have an idea of what to expect. Um, so, in the work that you do, what what would you say are, are the moments that bring you the most fulfillment and joy? Uh, well, definitely when somebody says, and we're ticking off their goals, and we can tick them all off, and they're going, oh. I feel so much better. Mm -hmm. I can't believe how much better I feel. I had mm -hmm. no hope before, and now I'm able to take care of my kids, or I'm able to go traveling, or you know whatever they're they're uh, wanting to do with their personal life. Mm -hmm. And so we have a little board where people write those types of things on, and when they're feeling, you know, that enthusiasm and uh, seeing the difference, that is just my biggest rush of dopamine. Awesome, awesome. Dopamine That's beautiful. That, that that hormone, right? That you know, job well done. Is that, mm -hmm. that back right yeah and yeah. i just love that awesome that's beautiful so we have uh just under five minutes left so i'm, I'm gonna start winding things up and, and closing down but um at, in, in closing for for you um if you could only share three things that people should start implementing in their lives immediately to improve their health what would you say they would be um three things uh, i would number one and this is kind of a bigger thing and maybe it encompasses more than you want, but I would say try to have a nighttime routine. Mm -hmm. Think about what your evening routine should look like and then try to manifest it. Mm -hmm. Because we tend to go from dinner, cleaning up, getting kids things ready, lunches, you know, getting everything ready for the next day. Um, then we sit in front of the TV for a couple of hours and just kind of zone out. And then we want to just go to sleep and our mind's still thinking. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people to try to get an hour away from the TV so that blue light doesn't start blocking their melatonin. They'll get a better sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and journal about what they have done during the day and then what they need to do tomorrow. So what are the three top things I've got to get done tomorrow? That way when they're sleeping, they're not thinking, oh, I've got to remember to call that person. I've got to yep. that, that. Yep. Right? And then they, they can't sleep because their mind's going. So write down what you need to get done. Yeah. And then I think that's a great down. first one. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It helped me. I have like a little pad beside my bed. Um, then write down the three things you're grateful for mm -hmm. because it sets the right tone for sleep. It sets a tone of gratitude. So you cannot be anxious and grateful at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's not possible. So really kind of trying to hone that in and having a nice evening routine, quiet music or something funny if you're going to watch mm -hmm. something. Um, nice music, maybe the smell of lavender. Use all of your senses. Again, bring mindfulness mm -hmm. to your evening so that you're really kind of slipping into sleep and it's a nice segue. You'll get to bed earlier. You'll feel better in the morning. You'll wake up more energetic and ready to do what you want to do. Gotcha. So many people wake up through the night. They can't get to sleep. They wake up, they yeah, feel lousy. Totally. The way they enter into sleep 
can make a huge difference for how your next day works. Absolutely. And we just have about two minutes left. So um, I, I, I definitely want to get to the to the other two things. So okay. I don't mean to cut you off, but we, it okay. just cuts us off. So sorry. Six, six to eight vegetables every day. Eat the mm -hmm. rainbow. Um, and um, well, I talked about gratitude already and move your body. Yeah. Find some way to move your body that you enjoy. Absolutely. So sleep, get a good routine at night. Six to eight, would you say six to eight vegetables a day? And move your body. I 100% agree. 100% agree. So um, again, Dr. George, and, and your your practice is located in Plantation or Sunrise. Sunrise, Sunrise. right near Sunrise Mills Mall. Great, great. Um, and everybody, you can check out um, at Vita Integrative Medicine is um, Dr. George's social media. And again, as always, I thank you very much all for being here. I always welcome your comments, feedback, suggestions. Please reach out to either of us. Um, check out all the episodes of The Art of Mindful Medicine on YouTube. If you just search The Art of Mindful Medicine, you can also check out my website, www.mindful.doctor. Uh, again, the show is on Instagram Live on Saturdays at 12 noon Eastern. Um, and again, like I said, if you, if you have missed any previous episodes, check them out on YouTube and all the future episodes will be on YouTube. And reach out to Dr. George or I if you have any questions about anything we discussed. And as always, I end with a quote. And this is from Paulo Coelho. If you really want to be successful and you really want to be happy, don't have a job. Have a purpose. When, you ha when you've got a purpose, the whole world is your office. So I will definitely I will end with that. And um, I, I, again, Dr. George, thank you so, so, so much for being on here. I know we've been uh, talking um, for several months now to, to, to link up on here. And this was fantastic. Um, and I'm sure in the future, I would, I'd love to have you back on again uh, because there's just so much valuable information and the things that you do and, and people can benefit in, in so many, so many ways. And so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Pachi. I said it right. Um, and everybody, again, Carolyn, have a beautiful Saturday. Thank you, everybody. Have a fantastic Saturday. And I appreciate you, you guys all being here. And remember, stay awesome, stay mindful. Have a good uh, one. Thank you. I'm grateful for you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.